Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this lesson, we're back in lab number one, exercise number three, customize the UI, and we'll start with task number one, uh, modify the start page. So in task number one, we're asked to make some changes to the user interface by modifying the standard 250 by 250 item template that is defined in the standard styles.xaml in the common folder of our project. Uh, and that should affect how the recipe data items are displayed in the grouped items page, the start page for our app. But before we do that and take these steps and perform these actions, I want to step back and get a larger picture of what's going on here. You know, Microsoft requires apps that will be submitted to the Windows Store to follow a number of guidelines. And I want to bring your attention to two specific requirements. The first is with regards to scaling. The app UI should look great on a variety of form factors, from 10 inch screens at a 1024 by 768 resolution up to 27 inch screens running at 2560 by 1440 resolution. Similarly, an app can be in a number of different UI states, including landscape, which is the default, portrait, and then snapped and filled view, which we've seen, uh, I believe, in the first lesson of this video series. And we could use the simulator and kind of walk through all these scenarios, snapped, filled, portrait, landscape, large screen, small screen, and so on. But the key idea here is that the layouts are flexible. And so flexible layouts that adapt to all these scenarios are important to Microsoft because they're important to Microsoft's customers and ultimately to your customers, all right? So how do you actually create flexible layouts? Well, building flexible layouts that work equally well in all of these various states and scale nicely across these different resolutions could involve a lot of hard work. Fortunately, we can use the built-in XAML controls in the Visual Studio Grid App Template, which handle a lot of the complexity for us. So in the Grid App Template, each of the three pages have a different layout, as we've seen already. All right, so let's open up Visual Studio, and we're going to start in the Grouped Items view. XAML. And we've already looked at this m several times, and you're probably sick of looking at it at this point. But uh, just a reminder, we have an outermost grid that controls the overall layout of the page, and then we have a grid view that rests inside of it. And the grid view is what displays the recipe groups and the items. And so here we go, beginning in line 40, you can see that there's quite a bit going on in the definition of the grid view. And it looks like there's a lot going on here, but what I want to do is dissect the most important parts. So first, remember the hierarchy of our data, that a group like Chinese food owns individual items like Chinese food recipes. The page contains a series of groupings, and each grouping represents the group and its associated items. We're only displaying the group's title, but we're also displaying each of the associated items in large squares beneath the title. Now with that in mind, the XAML that we see at a high level are in two main sections. There's this grid view.items panel, and then there's this grid view.group style. Okay? So let's start with the, the first one and, and ask ourselves the question what are these here for? Well, the items panel defines uh, the entire area that's available for the data, both groups and items that will be displayed. And the uh, items panel template is just that. It's a template for how the items in the panel will be displayed. It defines inside of it a virtualizing stack panel. Uh, stack panels are used to stack controls horizontally or vertically. So we'll be stacking each of the items, in this case, horizontally. A virtualizing stack panel, a special kind of stack panel, however, adds a twist. It says to our data source, hey, don't give me every single item that you can pull out of your data source. Say you have thousands of, of items, thousands of recipes. I don't want all of those. I only need as many as I can display on screen uh, at a time. So first it determines how many could possibly fit into the display area at any given time by determining the amount of space required to display all the items versus how much screen real estate is available in the given device. Then it has some plumbing that works with your data source to save memory and processor resources and only grab what it needs. 
from your data, all right? And I have greatly oversimplified this, but hopefully you get the idea. So just out of curiosity here, let's, uh, let me change the zoom level here so we can see a little bit more of this. There we go. What if we were to change the orientation from horizontal to vertical? How would that change uh, what is displayed on our app? And you can see that instead of horizontally displaying all the groups, we just see a single column of groups and all of their items beneath it, all right? So the grid view items panel controls the entire viewable area for all groups and their items. And so let's set this back to horizontal. All right, and that looks a little bit more like what we're accustomed to. So it's easy to confuse this, this grid view items panel with something that we're gonna learn about a little bit later, which is the gr uh, group style dot panel. This affects how individual items are rendered within a single group. Now, you don't have to memorize this or anything. Just be aware that there's a difference, and we'll come back to that in just a moment. So we just finished talking about the grid view items panel, and it affects how the entire, the entire set of groups and items are laid out in our app, all right? So next up, we're gonna take a look at the group style. Grid view dot group style. The group style, it obviously comprises the majority of the definition for the grid view. Uh, inside we see that it has a group style dot header template and then it has the group style panel which I referenced just a moment ago. So let's take a look at this group style header template. You might think it's odd that for example there is a button inside of this but this is what allows the user to click on the group title and navigate to, for example, the group detail page, where we can see more details about a particular group. The button's style attribute is statically bound to something called the text primary button style, and it is defined in the standard styles.xaml. Do you remember how to easily get there? Let's go into the miscellaneous category for in the properties window for our button and under style you can see it's bound and I'm just gonna click go to source that'll open up the standard style with the button selected with the button style selected rather and so this um, this text primary button style here defined on line 228 is based on or rather inherits from a text button style. Uh, where is that defined? Well, we could use the find, you know, control F to find it, uh, but I think the easiest way would just be to look at the line number and follow along here. All right, so line 152, which removes, if you take a look at what it's doing here, it is actually removing the typical attributes of a button like the border and such. The only thing that the text primary button style adds is it sets the foreground to this static resource application header foreground theme brush all right now if you search for this and let me just make sure before i lie to you here yeah if you search for this actually throughout the entire the entire solution you're not going to find it and you might be thinking well what gives all right, where is it defined? Well, it's actually a default color property that's defined in Windows 8. If it had a definition, it might look something like this on the slide you see on screen, uh, where, for example, the color might be set to, to white, the hex, uh, the hex equivalent to white, all right? But it's basically a solar, solid color brush. So there are some implicit system-defined brushes that we're simply not privy to, or at least not in Visual Studio. Uh, and then there's ones that are explicitly laid out here in the standard styles and so on. Now, I haven't done this, but I understand that you can actually see the implicit styles in Windows 8, uh, the, their definitions. If you use Microsoft Expression Blend, feel free to report back to me if you've been able to get that to work correctly. I haven't even tried it. But uh, back to the button's definition. Let's get back here. If you recall, back in the Cheater's Guide to XAML, way back in less than like two and three, uh, I showed you how we could use the button's default property, which is the content, to host a stack panel with an image and a text block. Well, that same tactic is employed right here. The button here contains a stack panel, which in turn contains two text blocks. Uh, 
uh, that are stacked right next to each other or on top of each other. Oh, actually right next to each other, yeah, okay. The first text block is the, the title for the group and then the second text block contains that little arrow or that chevron which is defined as a static resource, okay? And it's off to the, uh, to the right hand side obviously of the group title. All right, so let's take a look now at the next section. We referenced this just a moment ago, the group style panel, and the panel represents the individual items that are being bound to. Now, earlier I said that it's easy to get this confused with how the grid view items panel work. I, I know I was a bit confused with the difference between the two. You might think that the panel would show us a list of groups, not the items inside each group. But you can see how this works if you were to change the orientation again, make just a tiny little change here from vertical to horizontal and see how that affects the layout for a given group. You can see that the items panel template controls how each group's items are rendered, all right? So whenever you wanna figure out how something works or what it's actually doing, uh, do what I do and that is just make these small changes uh, to little properties that you know and uh, that you know that it's either this setting or that setting or if you wanted to change the margin and say I wonder what the the margin if I set it to 10 what it would do oh it shifted everything over 10 pixels okay I see how that works so you make a tiny change and you see how it affects the output sometimes I even create an entire application and just throw it away uh, just to learn a new technique so always experiment it's fun it's easy and you learn a lot from doing it Okay, so I think we covered the basic settings of the grid view and what uh, things that we haven't talked about up to this point. But we never really talked about how the grid knows how to navigate from the groups in our collection of data to the items in our data source. And that deserves a little bit of our attention. So let's roll back up here to our collection view source, which we've already looked at at length in a previous lesson, our collection view source. And we want to pay particular attention this time to the is source group and items path attributes. Uh, so if the items in the source data collection are objects that contain collections, like in our case the group, then each group contains or rather references a collection or rather an I enumerable of item called top items. So if that's the case, you have to also set the items path equal to the collection, the name of the collection, in this case, top items. That's why we see the items path set this way. So that gets us to a list of items in the collection, but how are they all bundled together in groups? Well, that's what this is source grouped equals true is for. So to recap, the collection view sources settings are giving the following instructions. Anything bindable on this page, like the grid view, or the list view, it should be bound to groups, which comes from the data source class via the default view model, and is really an observable list of recipe data group. Top items is a property of each recipe data group, and it includes no more than 12 recipe data items. Finally, if we're gonna be presenting top items, are these grouped together? Yes. The is source grouped equals true, meaning that all top items should be split up into their groupings, so they should be represented along with their representative recipe data groups. All right? So that is the meaning of those two attributes and how they allow us to navigate from group to items and keep everything kind of bundled together. All right? So let's get back to the, uh, the data template for each of the items, which is defined in the grid view in this item template attribute. We've already looked at this once. Let's go ahead and find this here in the properties window. We can see the item template is bound and we can go to its source in the standard styles.xaml puts us at about line 1645, all right? And you recall we talked about this in lesson number three. Remember the purpose of a data template. It's to customize the visual representation of each data item from our data source. And we've already looked at this. Each data item, each recipe, will be rendered as a grid, okay? Inside the grid, there will be an image 
and a border around it. And then there will be two text blocks in a section below inside of a stack panel. And that stack panel has this opaque color that lays on top of it so that we can see uh, the text that lays on top of it. And so there's some specific attributes of the XAML controls that might be new to us. For example, the stretch attribute of the image. You generally want to uh, look these sorts of things up. And I use Bing.com for this purpose. So I might do something like the following. So let's go uh, Bing.com. And then I'll uh, search for site Microsoft.com. And I'll try to type in, I'll try to use the entire namespace and class name if I can get it here. Now in this case, I'm only seeing image.stretch. So it might take a little investigation work to find the entire, uh, the entire namespace and the class name. I happen to know in this case, it's windows.ui.xaml uh, and then image. And, and so I might even just break it up because I'm not sure exactly the hierarchy here, but image.stretch. And when I search for that, it should take me somewhere within Microsoft.com. And because I specified uh, Windows.UI.XAML, that puts me specifically into those classes that are used within the WinRT, all right, as opposed to an image.stretch that might be used in a different presentation technology like WPF or some other presentation technology, okay, that might use the same class names and attribute names and so forth, all right? So at any rate, we learned that the stretch value is actually an enumeration. And it can be set to none or fill or uniform or uniform to fill. And this dictates how the image will fill the area of the rectangle that's available for displaying the image, assuming that it can't fit nicely given the difference in proportions between the image and the area that it needs to fill. All right, and so yeah, I would encourage you to experiment with this. If you get an image that, for example, the orientation is off and it tries to either cram it all in and everything looks squatty, or it cuts things off to the right-hand side, then you're gonna to need to adjust this stretch attribute on the image itself, all right? So my point is not specifically about the stretch enumeration. That's not really what I'm trying to get at here, but rather how you go about learning the various attributes. You have to feel comfortable with doing the right kind of search within Bing and reading the documentation and determining which setting makes sense for your situation, given uh, whatever you're trying to accomplish. Okay, so now that we have some background on the grid view and the data template that we're going to be changing in the next lesson, that should give us the confidence to make the change and to understand the impact of those changes. And so we'll start with that in the next lesson. Thank you. Mm -hmm.